and you love us more than we can know. Father, we've all been through some, we've all been through some hard things, but I'm here to say that his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Gosh, I like to move around. I'm gonna preach. This is hard to, I'm going to take this out of here. I'll get it. <laughs> probably. Oh, I did there. Okay. No probably about it. There were two farmers. Where one farm ended, the other farmer's farm began. Matter of fact, these farmers were brothers. They got along great for years and years. They got along great. They shared labor when the other brother needed it. They'd have workers go over and help them. They shared their farm equipment and tools. They got along great for years. Then one day, some little thing got said by one of the brothers, and it really rankled the other brother. He didn't like it. And he did that famous thing that many of us have done. The first thing that came in his mouth, he in his brain, he let shoot right out of his mouth. Not a good plan. Not the biggest thing in the world like many of these things develop, but, you know, if you take care of them right away, they're, they're great, but they let it just kind of simmer and boil a little bit. They spent the night thinking about that, and they got madder at each other. And then it got to be where they'd work together, but they wouldn't talk, and then it got less and less where they'd work together. Instead of sharing their lunch together, they'd both go to their own homes to eat. And pretty soon, it just kind of blew up. It blew up in a big argument, and they didn't help each other at all. Didn't even talk to each other. But one day, there was a knock on the one brother's door, and there stood a man with a carpenter's toolbox on his shoulder. He said, sir, have you got a little work around the farm? He said, I sure could use a couple days' work. And he thought a minute, and then he said, wait a minute. You know, I think I got just the thing. He said, follow me down here. And they walked across the field and down by a creek. And he said, you see this creek here? That used to be a meadow. Our farm's just connected right together. See that farm right over there? He said, that's my brother's farm. We used to have a meadow here. He said, but just for spite, he took his bulldozer down to the river levee, and he put this crook in here between us so we couldn't even get to each other, just for spite. He said, I want to do him one better. He said, you see that lumber drying up there by the barn? I want you to take that lumber, and I want you to build me a nice fence right along this river here. He said, high enough that I won't even be able to see him. He said, that'll, that'll fix him. He won't even be able to look at him. Well, the carpenter looked at him and said, you know, he said, I think I understand just what you need. The farmer and his wife had to go away for a couple of, for a little while to visit his, his, her mother in another town. And then when they got back, that farmer was so anxious to get down and get a look at that nice fence. He ran down there towards the creek. And then his mouth just hung open. There was no fence there at all. That carpenter had built the bridge. He built the bridge across the creek. A beautiful job with the handrails and all. And there in the middle of that bridge was his brother with his hand out. And he said, oh, brother, he said, I, I can't believe you'd build this beautiful bridge for me when, when all as nasty as I've been, he said, will you please forgive me? They embraced and forgave each other. Listen, I'm, I'm, I've got to get another drink here while I can move my mouth. <laughs> what am I trying to say? Be a, be a bridge builder instead of a bridge burner. <laughs> Show some love. Lots of times it has to be the people that you don't even think maybe your favorite, most lovable people. But you can do it. You can do it. Matthew 5, 23 and 24 is that portion of Scripture that talked about when you bring your offering to the altar and while you're there, 
you remember they have ought against your brother? He said, <laughs> just leave it there. Go back. Get back together again with your brother. Then come back and give your offering. Doesn't say go to your brother and make excuses. Doesn't say go and tell your side of the story. <laughs> it says go and make it right. Forgiveness doesn't have any ifs or buts. Not the God kind of forgiveness. How many people ever got those uh, apologies from somebody that sounded like five seconds of I apologize, I'm sorry, and then about ten minutes of all the reasons why they were right and you were wrong or, or the excuses for their actions. You know, I think this time as we've been spending so much time at home and not being able to do so many things we're used to doing, it's a time, I, I don't know about you, but I've done, been doing some reflecting myself. I mean, you've got some time to reflect. You know, thinking about the, the past or some things. You know, I lost, lost my sister kind of in the middle of this whole thing. Couldn't even go to Jersey to have a funeral or anything. But uh, doing some reflecting. But thinking about, don't just think about the bad times. Everybody's had some bad times. Anybody here never had any bad times? Everything for you has just been one big bowl of cherries. So far, zero in the hand capacity here. But listen, don't just think about the hard times. I know they come in your mind sometimes. The devil is good about that. Think about the good times, too. Think about the good times. You know, unfortunately, I know more than one person, and maybe you have, too, who had actually gone right to the grave, never forgiven somebody that they were very close to at one time. What a shame that is. Somebody they might have been best friends with. Build a bridge if you can do it. Now I think about a very good friend of ours, John, good Christian man. He was an absolute terror in his younger days for most of his uh, early adult life, was a heavy drinker and a fighter and a gambler, took drugs. But when he got saved, he got the whole thing. <laughs> he just, that's all he talks about now. He's uh, serving the Lord mightily. But I remember not that long ago when his sister was dying, she was passing away from cancer and he spent a lot of time because she didn't really want to be in a hospice or something. She wanted to be home. And, I mean, it, it, it's not easy. We know personally because Hazel took care of our daughter all through that kind of stuff. And it's not easy. But he did a lot of things he didn't think he could do with, with uh, his sister. But he said that, that he had plenty of time and he told her everything that was on his heart while she was there. Because <laughs> she stood up for him no matter what happened. He'd go out and get in a big fight and cause a ruckus and everything else, and it'd really be his fault, he'd admit. But she'd swear it had to be the other guy's fault. She loved them despite everything that went on. It didn't matter. She loved them, and he let her know just how much that meant to him to know that how much he loved them. And I just, my word is don't leave something unsaid. I mean, once people are gone, it's hard to say it. I mean, I think the Lord can still give you a release from it. So if you've been in that position, don't feel condemned or don't feel like some, some terrible thing. Just talk to the Lord about it and get it under the blood. But say what you can say now. You know, Hazel's going to come up from now and share for a minute.
okay now? Okay. <laughs> a lot of people here know know us and um, know that we've had a daughter who uh, is in heaven, but she battled cancer for 15 years and two months. And um, in that time, there was a lot of time that we had talking to her and being with her. And, you know, it, it, her family and anyone that knew her and loved her, a lot of good conversations. And when the time came where it was very close for her to go to heaven, we were all there with her. And everything was said. She knew there was nothing between her and us. And we had this opportunity to do that. And that's great. A lot of people do. But a lot of people don't. Um, uh, we had the first... Christian family that became our friends after we gave our life to the Lord. Uh, their son and our daughter got married. <laughs> and they were part of our family for ever since, like 40 years. And we had good times together, and they were there all the time with us. And the day she passed, they were right there at the house. And so, of course, they were at her funeral. And uh, our Amy was a writer, and she had written this, this little article about the ride of a lifetime, and it was all about being on a roller coaster and the ups and downs and the fears, and you're, you're in there with straps on you. And the whole point of this article was with, it's a ride of a lifetime, she called it, because you're going to go through things, the ups and downs, and as long as you're in that roller coaster, traveling with the Lord, he's got you. And then you'll get off one day and go to heaven with him. Well, our friend Harold, that was our friend's name, he was so impressed when that was read at the funeral that he wanted a copy of it. So we got him a copy, and um, we had the funeral dinner, and... You know, we all went home. The next morning, my daughter, Melissa, who that was her father-in-law, called hysterical that Harold had died. Suddenly, thank God he was a good Christian man, and he loved the Lord, and people had, you know, I, I don't know if anybody needed to say sorry in his life, but it was gone. The chances were gone. Our uh, grandson, Adam, that comes sometimes, he lives next door, and, and I was his grandfather, and Saturday mornings, he's a big, healthy man, he'd go in the woods and chop some wood, and he never came back, and they tried to call his cell phone, and it, it, no answer, so Adam went and found him. The point is, if you have something to say to somebody, please do it now. You know, don't let any hard feelings or unforgiveness or think like, okay, you know, I'll do it next week. Um, do it today. We have many friends that have lost loved ones. We've lost loved ones. Most of the time, it's suddenly and you're not with them. And you don't have a chance to say, I'm sorry. And even if it isn't an apology, even if it isn't an unforgiveness thing, just to tell somebody that you love them and you're thinking about them and that you just, just that they're on your heart, do it. Don't put it off. Another little example is one of our granddaughters, um, her husband, got thinking one day. He said, you know, I have this aunt, and she lives far away, but she never forgets my birthday, never forgets Christmas, and she's always so been so nice. So he said, I think I'm going to write her a letter. So he wrote her a letter. And he addressed it, and he put it on his dresser. He was putting off mailing it. A few days later, he got a call. She passed, and the letter never got to her. So it's just so important that if you're thinking of somebody, if they're on your heart, if you need to make something right, please do it while you have time to do it. And if you know, you just want to say, I love you, <laughs> 
and give them a, a special little encouragement for that day, do that too. It's really important to not put off today for t tomorrow what you can do today. Uh, Matthew 5, 9 tells us that blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. In 5, 7, it says, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Anybody need mercy? Jesus spent much of his ministry tearing down barriers and building bridges. He did it through acts of love, such as washing the feet of those who would fail him and even betray him, eating with a tax collector that everybody in town despised, and giving hope to a fallen woman that since society had condemned. James 3.18 tells us that peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Words of peace are like seeds. They don't produce fruit overnight but boy, they'll get down the ground there and they'll start working and they'll work on people's hearts and lives. The only way I've seen I've made any real inroads, I've had situations over the years, even with family, where you, you get the hollering and the yelling don't seem to work. <laughs> but the, the loving on them seems to get through. You know, there's a, a lot of great things that forgiveness is, what it'll do for you. You know, forgiveness doesn't always make what happened right. If somebody really hurts you, forgiving doesn't mean that you agree with what they did or even that it makes it right. It's, it means you've made a decision not to let it control your life. If 30 years after somebody deeply hurts you, you're still suffering, guess what? I don't, maybe it's a hard way to put it, but it gets to be a problem of choice almost. God is waiting and desires more than anything to help heal you so that you're not so brokenhearted. You don't let it. You can remember it when you need to avoid a similar situation, but it doesn't control your life. The other person refuses to acknowledge what happened or that it was wrong. The offense can and should still be forgiven. Forgiveness doesn't depend on the other person. It depends on you. The onus is on you. <laughs> yeah. When you think of what we've been forgiven of, anybody got some things that they're really glad is under the blood now? <laughs> God didn't say, you know, well, that's, I'm sorry, but there's one I can't forgive, you know. You'll have to, you'll have to labor under the burden of that one. You no. Know? Forgiveness matters even when the offending party refuses to admit guilt. When you wait for someone to admit here she was wrong, you're placing your future in that person's hands. Forgiveness is first and foremost for your own benefit, not the benefit of others. By forgiving, you're letting the pain and hurt go and moving forward with your life. Your willingness to forgive can move the other person to seek forgiveness. I have seen that. Like in our story with the bridge builder, your forgiveness, somebody might just be too embarrassed. Maybe they just don't have the gumption to come to you, even if they want to. They just don't have it in them to be able to come and humble themselves and apologize or whatever. Lots of times, your actions are forgive, then that person will feel the freedom to ask for forgiveness as well.
You know, I think the times that I've struggled with unforgiveness, and even as a Christian, I have to admit, there's been times I've struggled with it. We've been through some things and been hurt. Some things. Even struggled for a while with forgiving my own father for some of the things that he did and wouldn't even talk to him. But I think how much stress it kind of causes you to be laboring in that unforgiveness. It really does. You know, I've had times when we're going through things where I lay awake at night, wake up the next morning, and I am more tired than when I went to bed. We know that worrying doesn't take away tomorrow's trouble. It just takes away today's peace. And we need that peace that pastor was talking about. Now, I'm talking about this because I believe wholeheartedly what pastor preached last week. He talked to, remember that story did so much to me there about the lint being stuck and, and the cell phone, and he wasn't being able to charge the phone because it wasn't plugging in there good enough. He, he dug that lint out of there. Church, we need to get whatever, whatever lint might be stuck in that spot in our lives. The more we get out, the more powerful this church is going to be. We are on the cusp of something really great here. I believe with all my heart, I can feel it. I've been used to, we, we've been saved about 40 years, and I can feel when things are starting to stir and to go the right way for the Lord, and we're on the cusp of that. We can't let things in our path hold us back any longer. We don't need them. We don't need them. Now, I've been in arguments with people where I lay awake at night and I'm thinking, boy, you ever start to think of the zingers you could have used if you only would have thought of them while you were at the time? I'll get them the next time we talk. You know. not, not good. <laughs> A woman named Catherine of Siena once said, how many are the pains of those who hunger for revenge? They have killed themselves even before they killed their enemies. Ask yourself, have I ever taken revenge on another? How has it made you feel when you have had a, a real argument with somebody real heated words and going on, and you've really lambasted them with your words. How that made you feel? Did it make you feel really good then? Now, I'll agree that maybe for a minute when you're letting it out, it's almost like a steam release valve on your furnace or something. <laughs> Let's off some pressure. But man, when I've done it, I have felt lousy afterwards. I know I've done what I shouldn't have done. I know I should have controlled them my, myself more and I did not feel very good about it. Yet those heartworm pills are just drying me out. I don't know what it, it might not be. Oh, what do I say those things? I have no idea the other night. There's an old Jewish proverb that says the smallest revenge will poison the soul. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Satan will not cast out Satan. That means that hatred or retaliation will not resolve other wrongs, but actually multiplies the evil in the situation, giving the devil even more power over it. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, showing love and forgiving each other, even as Christ has forgiven us. You know, the German philosopher Schopenhauer once said that the human race is kind of like porcupines on a cold winter night, you know. The colder it gets, the more they huddle together, and the closer they huddle together, the more they pick each other with their sharp quills. That was Schopenhauer. I don't know whether I'm... I don't think he's with us anymore, Tim. I think he was like way a long time ago. No, feeling betrayed or misused sometimes by some that we, someone that we trust is just part of life, I'm afraid. 
If you're dealing with human beings, that's part of life. But how you and I respond to that kind of situation is very important. If the devil has his way, we'll let that experience wound us so deeply that we won't want to even make another close friend. Now, I remember that old Simon and Garfunkel song. I am a rock. I am an island. You know, I never loved. I never would have cried. You know, I'd say, lock myself away someplace. And what good does that do you? You know, that's a lonely, miserable life. You know, you've been hurt. Go for it again. Go for it again. Being alone, just just saying, no, well, I'm not, I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You know, if it happens to us and we figure we're just going to kind of isolate ourselves now, we won't be hurt anymore, then the devil's won. If, we, if we're out of the picture, our gifts that God has placed in us are likewise out of the picture. You know, betrayal is something that has happened to people since the beginning of time. It's simply a fact that the devil is a master at distorting and ruining relationships. He knows how to lure people into situations where they end up feeling offended or hurt. Then he comes to nurture that offense until it mutates into strife that separates even the best of friends and family. You know, don't forget that Satan was kicked out of heaven because of his unique ability to create confusion, discord, and strife. You know, there couldn't be a more perfect environment than heaven. There's no lack, no sickness. Still, the devil was able to affect one-third of the angels with his slanderous allegations against God. Angels who had worship together for eons of time now stood opposed to each other over issues the devil had conjured up in their mind. That should tell you how clever the devil is at creating discord. If the devil is persuasive enough to do this with angels, think how much easier it is for him to deceive people who live in a far from perfect environment and who wrestle daily with their own imperfections and self-images. Adam and Eve alone are a pretty good example. God's first two children. Hazel, you're... Hazel's going to come up and I'm going to sit on this chair. Pay no attention. How many know it's not always that you get hurt by somebody else? Sometimes we're the ones that hurt somebody. And... Uh, I, I am one of them. You know, the devil always waits for an opportune time. He sees what you're doing. He sees if you're stressed. He sees if you're tired, if you're going through some things that are hard. And he waits, and then he throws a fiery dart right into your heart. I had one of those situations where I was talking to people I love, and terrible hard things going through, and I was just, oh, I was burdened, I didn't know what to do, I was hurt, and uh, the phone rang. I have three brothers and one sister, and it was my brother, and unfortunately, there was some issues in our family, bad issues after my dad passed, and I was like the one that was talking to everybody. I mean, I had them at the house, and I had my brothers there and my sister, and, you know, we, we had fellowship. But I took on the offense of someone, and it was in me. I wasn't about to speak it out, but it was in me. And the phone rang, and it was my brother, and he had this whole big scenario that him and my other brothers had decided that I would do, and it was not something that I could do or wanted to do. So he's given me a little argument, and boy, that offense that was inside of me came out big time. 
And that's six years ago. And one of my brothers took and got offended with my brother and has not talked to me in six years. And I missed them. And I missed the good times. Uh, I missed the family gatherings, which we always did. Um, I miss their children because, you know, sometimes it just isn't one person. It's a whole family. And the families, I have nieces and nephews and great nieces and nephews that I don't even, I've never seen. So sometimes we're the ones that cause the offense. And you know what? I've tried. I used to call. They won't answer my calls. Uh, block me from Facebook. <laughs> sent letters, but then had the letters returned, unopened. So sometimes when we're trying to make it right, the only thing we can do, which is the best thing we can do, is give it to God and keep praying. Um, my brothers are not Christians, and that's the most important thing to me, is that they get their hearts right with God. And I pray and pray and, you know, I have to let it there. But the big part of things like this, too, sometimes you don't forgive yourself. Sometimes when you're the one that has offended somebody, it's hard to forgive yourself for what you've done. And then you get bitterness inside, and the only way that you can be released from that is to forgive yourself, along with forgiving. It was no problem for me to forgive my brothers. I loved them. And even if they never, ever said sorry for any of it, I don't care. But to forgive yourself, because we know we have an enemy that keeps whispering into your ear all the time. Look, if you didn't do this, you would be still having family affairs and things. But forgive yourself and know that God loves us and he loves the people that we offended. And this is another part of offense that you don't think of. Sometimes we can hurt people by not what we've done, but what we haven't done. Um, I had a, a sister in the Lord who came to me one day and told me she had unforgiveness for a few years toward me. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know what I did. And I, then she went on to tell me it's because what I didn't do. One day she was in need of prayer. And um, I had prayed a lot with her before. And this day, there was other people, so I didn't pray too. I just walked away. And that hurt her really bad. I had never realized that it did until she told me. So when you have unforgiveness in your heart, you're, you're holding that person, you're holding them in a prison of your heart, you know? And the only way to let them out of that prison is to forgive them. And she forgave me, thank God. But, you know, so sometimes we, not sometimes, all the time we should check our heart and say, is there something that someone has unforgiveness toward me that I don't realize, God? And you know what? The Holy Spirit will show us so we can make things right, even though that we didn't realize we made it wrong. reading different things about people who had about forgiveness, you know, how they're Corey Ten Boom. Anybody know who Corey Ten Boom is? I'm sure Tim does. I know from you, but also some other people. She was a great, there's a bell right there. She was a lady evangelist years ago at a time when lady evangelists were not that prevalent. <laughs> She even wound up as a child, her whole family, getting put in a Nazi concentration camp. And while she was there, she lost about most of her family. Her little sister, Betsy, died from the abuse the guards heaped on her. Well, when the war ended and the camps were liberated, she was doing, holding a big revival meeting in Austria big revival and after the revival service was over she was outside and, and a, a man came up to her and 
started speaking to her. He said, Corey, do you recognize me? She said, no, sir, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you. He said, I was one of the guards in that camp. He said, as a matter of fact, I was one that heaped abuse and physical harm on your sister. He said, I've given my heart to the Lord. Is there any way you can please forgive me? He said, I've changed my life. And he, and he put out his hand. And she said, at first, I just couldn't do it. There was no way I could raise my hand up. And, and the Lord spoke to her. And he said, Corey, I want you to forgive that man. I want you to forgive him. If you want forgiveness, you want a forgiveness for your life. You need to forgive this man. And she said it was just an act of her will. She didn't feel it in her heart at all. She said, Lord, if I do it, you're going to have to supply the feelings because I don't want to do it. But she lifted up her hand. And when she felt his hand in hers, she said the feelings came. Her heart melted. And she forgave that man. Despite that, we can do it. You know, sometimes you've been hurt so bad that you don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. You feel in your heart that person doesn't deserve it. We're like that many times. We can only forgive because God in Christ has first forgiven us. That's the only reason we can even do it. Paul reminds us, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Colossians 3.13. For in truth, we cannot live as freed and forgiven sinners until we are able to extend that same forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Now, I'm going to just... You know, there are many, many very inspiring stories that are connected with the writing of some of our favorite hymns. Horatio Spafford, some of you have probably read his story. He lost his, his wife and four daughters were on the way to England when a big storm came up. He didn't go because he had to finish some work in Chicago and then he was going to join them later. And that ship went down. And his wife was the only, he lost all four of his daughters. He was able still to write that hymn, I'm sure. You, when peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, you know the words, it is well, it is well with my soul. How could he do that? How could he say that? John Newton was a slave trader. A slave trader, after he received that, received the Lord and realized the horror that he was doing, wrote probably the most well-known and popular hymn in the world. He was, I mean, I've, I've sang and preached in little Baptist churches or Methodist churches, Presbyterian, uh, Brethren Church we go to, and on funerals for people, and even there would be Catholic people there. You sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Oh, man, they, they know that song. They know that song. To save the wretch like me, because he felt like a wretch from all he had done. He didn't know what it felt like to be a wretch when he thought of what he had done to those people. But it's hard to find a story that's much more peculiar than that that happened to William McKay. 
At the age of 17, McKay left his humble Scottish home to go to college. And his dear mother, I'll try to start gearing it down. I think the, the gathering musicians are starting to, trying to send me a, maybe I'll skip William McKay. No, I don't wanna, well, anywho. Uh, William, his, his, his mother was a, was a real Christian lady. She went out and she bought him a beautiful Bible and, she, and the inside cover, she wrote his name and a verse of scripture. And then when he left for college, she prayed for her boy every day. He started out well, but it wasn't long. He fell in with people and he started drinking heavily. He started living a life that wasn't anything like he'd been raised at home. Well, one night, wanting another bottle, he took that Bible, went to the pawn shop, and hocked that beautiful Bible his mother gave him. The years went by. <laughs> the years went by, and he finished his medical training, took up residency in a hospital in Edinburgh, Scotland. It was there that one day when the Lord just met him in the most unbelievable way, he went into the room of a young man, a young man that was obviously dying. He didn't have much time left. And he kept crying out. He kept crying out over and over again, bring me my book. I need my book. Please bring me my book. The doctor, it was so pitiful, the doctor finally told an orderly to go to a nearby rooming house and see if you can find a book in this man's room that he's looking for. Well, Dr. McKay heard a little later that night that this man had passed away, and curiosity got the best of him, and he went to his room to try to see what that book was. What book could a dying man, a young man, possibly want? Uh, you know, at this time, he went there and he found the book. You probably guessed it already. It was a Bible. He opened it up, and there was his name written in his mother's handwriting, William Patton McKay, and that scripture verse. He went back to his office and spent hours there praying and asking the Lord to please forgive him, to please forgive him. It affected him so much that he actually resigned his position at the hospital, went back to, to school and became a pastor. And he wrote many hymns Unless you think you can look it up, if you think it's just another story that somebody made up on the internet, no. He wrote a hymn that I've actually led when I used to be the song leader at the Hamlet Assembly of God back in the early 80s. We praise thee, O Lord, for the son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. You can forgive yourself. You can forgive yourself. If you've done the things, let me come up on, try to, just, well, don't be short, but quasi short. I just have to uh, do this because I feel it's important. Um, <clears throat> when our Amy was passing, we were all around her. We have four daughters and one son, and we were all there. And our son was at the bottom of her bed. <laughs> and um, the moment Amy took her last breath, our son hollered out her name. And um, later he told us what it was. Amy, with the cancer, had many surgeries. And she was missing arm, shoulder, collarbone. She, her hair was gone from chemo. She did not look like herself. The minute she left this earth and appeared to our son, she was completely healed. Her arm, everything was perfect. Thank you, Jesus. And she said one thing to him. 
She said, Stu, get as many people to come as you can. So I just want to tell you, heaven is real. And no matter what we go through here, when we get there, we're not going to be lacking anything. Amen. We're not even going to remember. I don't Amen. believe we'll even remember what we went yes, through. Jesus. But just make sure your heart's right. If you don't know the Lord, he's right here today. All you have to do is say, I need you, Lord. And he's right here for us, whatever we need. But I really needed to share that, you know what? For all of her suffering in that moment, it was gone. And, and she was perfect, and all yes. she wanted was for everybody to come to where she is. Please forgive me. I need your grace to make it through. All I have is you. I'm at your mercy. And Lord, I'll serve you. Until my dying day, help others find. 